Um, well, thanks so much, everyone, uh, for coming today and, and for Dale to inviting me uh, to give this talk on climate change. Obviously, it's a very current issue uh, with the Paris Climate Change Conference going on right now as we speak. Um, so I thought it was timely to, to, to take a look at some of the fact and some of the fiction surrounding climate change. So that's what we're going to do over the next 45 minutes to 50 minutes, something like that. So there's a, it's a bit of a journey here, but uh, we'll be moving forward. So, but first, a, a little background. Uh, obviously, most of you know, uh, know my background, um, but uh, for those of you who don't, uh, so I retired about actually seven months or so ago after 32 years, hi there, 32 years um, uh, working as a professional geologist um, in the oil patch. And then before that, I was nine years uh, in school, university, four years doing my bachelor's and five years doing my, uh, my doctorate. So basically, you add that all up, that's over 40 years of work as a professional scientist, and you'll see why that's kind of important to keep in the back of your mind here um, as we go forward. So um, I guess one of the questions um, you could say is, well, actually, before I do that, I'll, I'll give you a little bit more information. Um, uh, for Because you can see this is actually being videotaped as well and will be on YouTube um, whenever we get a chance to do that. So people on YouTube who don't know me, um, uh, I've just given you some of the background there. But the other thing I want to mention is I'm not currently employed by a solar, wind, hydro, or hydrocarbon company, nor am I heavily invested in any of them. I'm not belonging to a lobbyist group such as Greenpeace, and I do not get research or university funds at all. So I should be about as unbiased as is humanly possible here. So an unbiased scientist looking at facts. That's what we want. Now, Rosanna asked me a couple days ago how I got myself into this. And basically, um, the way I look at it is, um, over the past six or seven months, I think we've all been bombarded with information on how climate change is affecting our lives, uh, how we're actually having a big effect on climate change. Catastrophes could beset us, sea levels rising, increasing hurricane intensity, all these things. So. I've been hearing all these things, and since I've had a little bit more spare time, Dale's not been at me for the past six or seven months, I figured uh, that I would uh, spend a little bit of time researching some of the information regarding climate change. So that's where this all has uh, sprung from. So um, without further ado, we'll launch into what the climate change advocates are saying. There's two camps, as everyone knows. So the climate change advocates are basically um, talking about climate change. Global warming is the same thing, apparently. Um, the, the, the red things are the most important things. So that what the climate change advocates are saying, increase in global temperatures from pre-industrial times. Pre-industrial times are what I defined as 1900 and before. So increasing global temperatures from that time due to rapidly rising concentrations of greenhouse gases. So that's number two. Uh, then you'll see this IPCC, that's the UN body that um, oversees climate change uh, information, um, that they have concluded that man-made emissions of carbon dioxide have caused all of this planetary warming. And fourthly, with this planetary warming comes severe and catastrophic changes to the Earth's climate. So this basically is, that's the actual flow that I'm going to take today. I'm going to deconstruct this paragraph and we'll look at temperatures, we're going to look at greenhouse gas concentrations, we're going to look at emissions and compare um, can and does CO2 affect temperature, uh, a little bit about CO2 itself. And finally, we're going to finish off with what about severe and catastrophic changes? Are they happening? Yes or no? OK. So the other side is what we'll call the climate change skeptics. They're saying there's no convincing scientific evidence at all that any of this is happening, nothing. And in fact, what they also add in the second uh, paragraph or second sentence here is that their increases in atmospheric carbon dioxide produce many beneficial uh, effects. Hmm. Yes. Okay, so 
atmospheric carbon dioxide maybe is a good thing, or is it not? We will find out. So we're going to go on a little journey here using the scientific method. That's why I mentioned that I have over 40 years of, of uh, science background. So as you can see, the scientific method here is, here are the facts, and what you'll see today, I've gone through all the facts that I present here today. I've gone back to the original references. Every slide has a reference on the bottom of it because I've checked it. There's a lot of stuff on the internet you cannot trust, and I found a lot of it. Um, so I've actually fact-checked everything you will see today. Then, as everyone knows me here, I, once I've got facts, I roll in the facts, and I'm just evaluating the data, and then from that, we come up with the conclusions. Okay? What I call the faulty scientific method on the right here is, hey, what's the conclusion, and then what facts can we, can we find to support it? And what do you end up with? A faulty report. And I'll be talking about that coming forward too as well. You cannot have your mind made up before you start looking for facts because you will distort it. So that's a very important thing. So let's start with temperature. So we'll talk about paleoclimatic history of the Earth, but we're going to start talking about temperature because remember one of the advocates' um, tenets is that um, temperature has increased since pre-industrial times. So what is pre-industrial times? Well, actually it's basically from that line right there, which is today, zero, all the way back to the beginning of the Earth. And in fact, this is 545 million years ago in the Cambrian. So what I want to show you is that the Earth itself has actually been hot and cold. Hot and cold, hot and cold, hot. And in fact, right now, it's one of the coolest times in the history of the Earth. Right here, right now. So. That's probably not what you expected to see. I think a lot of people think that the, the, uh, the climate or the temperature has been constant since before pre-industrial times. It would just be constant. Well, that is not the case. There has been changes from millions and mi billions of years um, and very predictable changes that you can see here. So let's zoom in on this area right here. You can see there's a little bit more detail on this graph here. Let's look at the Cenozoic temperature history. So again, this is all temperatures we're looking at. So here's today, 65 million years ago. This is a temperature uh, along here in degrees Celsius. So this is today's temperature right here. That's where they zeroed it on. Everything is relative to, today, to today's temperature. What you can see is during the Eocene thermal maximum about 50 million years ago, the temperature was 16 degrees warmer than it is now. If I can hold questions until the end. That would be great, because otherwise we will be here for hours, okay? I love to have field questions, but let's have them at the end if possible. Just remember them. So 16 degrees uh, at that time, and you can see since that time it's actually been cooling all the way down to basically where we are right now. So what I want to do with, uh, I take you on a little journey now, is to compare one spot in Ellesmere Island where you can see this time, and you can see this time. So I'm going to take you back to the world 50 million years ago. You can see Middle Eocene time. You can recognize the continents quite well. Uh, we're going to be looking up here in the Arctic Islands. Um, why? Well, first of all, you can see that the Arctic Islands back in the Eocene were in the polar environment just like they are today. There's not been any continental drift to take them further into the polar environment, they were in a polar environment. What do you see now and what did you see then? Well, here's a picture now from Ellesmere Island. And you can see it's a barren, desolate, cold desert. This is what Ellesmere Island looks like. I've been there. This is what it looks like. Now, there's these scientists, geologists walking through here. There's these big bumps that they're coming across here. What are they? They're Eocene age fossilized trees. They're trees in the middle of a modern desert. So the reconstruction that these scientists have done is this is what the Arctic Islands looked like back 50 million years ago. Big trees, big mammals, alligators, palm trees. And that's not just here, all the way across to Alaska. Huge area. So to me, this is classic natural climate change. This is an example of natural climate change, changing from this kind of environment to the present day. 
No man has mucked with that. This is just natural. We weren't here at that time. Now we're going to zoom in a little bit more, to more uh, closer to modern times. Zero, here's modern times right here, 400,000 years ago. And on this side is temperature. So this is zero, so again, relative to present day here, uh, plus and minus. So what is this data? This is global temperature variations from this incredible piece of information from Antarctica. It's the Vostok ice core. It's three kilometer long ice core that was taken in the mid 1990s. Um, and what they've done is grabbed, they're able to, to compute temperature information uh, from the little bubbles that are in the ice core. They can actually measure gas compositions. And we'll see a lot of that information here today. It's an unbelievable piece of information. But what you can see is there's definitely some sort of natural thing going on. There's peaks of temperature, which are sort of similar to what we see here, and then lows down at least about eight minus eight minus nine down here going up to plus two or plus three. So swings of 10, 10 degrees or so within about a 10,000 year history. So to you that sounds like a lot. To geologists, it's a blink. It's al almost nothing. So what these are, these are glacial periods right here. And these little short things, which we are in right now, are interglacials between the glacial periods. So what did North America look like 21,000 year, 21, years ago in the peak of the last ice age? Here we are. In light blue is the extent of the North American ice sheet. So you can see Cordilleran, Laurentide, Greenland ice sheet. The whole area was covered with ice. How thick, you might ask? Well, I will show you. This is the thickness variations of ice sheets across the North American continent with, but relative to towns. Here's Toronto, over two kilometers of ice on top, 900 meters in Chicago, 1.25 in Boston, 3.3 kilometers of ice in Montreal. What about Calgary and Banff? Well, what we've been told, it's about a kilometer or so of ice. That's hard to imagine that would be a kilometer of ice here. So go stand next to the Calgary Tower. Stack five Calgary Towers on top. That's the thickness of ice that was here 21,000 years ago. Now, have, and now you can see what it's like. We're in an interglacial period here. That's happened naturally. That climate change happened naturally. We didn't make that happen. That happened naturally. So. A lot of stuff going on in behind the scenes here naturally. Now we're going to zoom in even closer in time. So again, here's modern day right here. This is 11,000 years ago. This is the time axis. This is temperature again here. Now we're actually zooming into 15 degrees C, which is the average for the Holocene or the recent period of um, the northern hemisphere. What you can see with temperature here, we're actually coming out of the last glacial period right in here, and then you can see about 9,000 years ago, we level out and we get highs, lows, the classic humpy bumpies I always talk about. So we get a hop, down, up, down, all the way along. And this is the little up that we're in right now. Here we are sitting here, but it's actually occurred here during the medieval warm period, the Roman climate optimum, and several other ones before. And it's been, uh, in between these highs have been lows. For example, there's one right here called the Little Ice Age. So you can see lots of changes have occurred that look very similar to what we're in right now in the past. <coughs> Let's continue. We'll zoom in one more time here. Climate changes over the last thousand years in Europe. Now we're starting to get into the historical information. People have actually written down this information. You might say before, oh, that's all isotope data and all kinds of other stuff like that. This is real data now, the historical data. People have have actually documented this. This is from basically modern day back to 900 AD. So at um, about 950 or so AD, we went into a period called the medieval warm period, which was about 0.75 of a degree warmer than the average. Doesn't sound like very much, but it was enough to green up Greenland so that the Vikings moved from Scandinavia and settled over on Greenland, farming uh, animals, um, they, they were able to, to farm the area there for two or three centuries. And eventually, the temperature started to drop. 
And he said, well, my, my crops aren't growing anymore. So they actually had to get shifted out of there. They abandoned all their um, settlements on Greenland because what was happening? We were going into the Little Ice Age. The peak of the Little Ice Age was 16 to 1700 AD. Um, and there was another little small one, which I call the Dickens Winters here, at about 1800. Charles Dickens was, was born in 1812. And if you think of his books, like The Christmas Carol, they, everyone always has big overcoats on and hats and it's snowing and there's, it just looks cold. Because the first 10 years of his life, London was minus 20 in the winter with snow. That's what he grew up with. So that's a lot of his books were based off of that early history that he has. These are called the Dickens Winters. And right around 1900, we came out of these, these blips here of the Little Ice Age and into the modern era. You can see two sort of highs punctuated by a bit of a low. But these, lo these highs here are similar to other highs and particularly not even, this is even bigger than this one here. So this is a, a big one. These are much smaller, of course. So um, this is what the Little Ice Age looked like. This is the Thames River frozen over 1677, right in the heart of the, of the uh, Little Ice Age. You can see his people here. The thickness of the ice was five or six feet thick. And this happened every winter for many, many years. They had ice fairs on the, um, the actual uh, Thames River. So this is something unbelievably unusual. Obviously, it hasn't frozen like this for hundreds of years. But this is what it was like on average from about 1600 to about 1900. This is what it would be. So unbelievable, but this is what's happening. OK, now we're getting into the modern era here. Um, so this is 1890 to 1900. So from this back, I would call those pre-industrial <coughs> times. From here forward, I would call those industrial times, in part, anyway. So this shows um, several data sets. These ones here in orange and red are satellite data sets. And these ones here are surface temperature and balloon sets. So lots of different um, data sets. Um, but they all seem to track each other. And so that's one thing I was looking for. Temperature is such a huge thing that we're talking about here. I wanted to make sure that everything was kind of copacetic here. And they are. They're all showing the same thing. We have a rise from about 1910 up to about 1940 or 1945. Right after the Second World War, it dropped to about 1975. And then this is the rise that a lot of the climate change advocates point to. They don't point as much to this one. It's more this one right here. No question, it's rising, but so is that. And a little drop right here as well. Let's have a look at the last 30 or so years, then this is the last temperature picture right here. So we're going to zoom in here. You can see here, so this line here, this is 1979. So this is the average line in the middle here of the whole period, 30 years from 1981 to 2010. That's the average. And you can see, okay, this was just below, but you can see a trend from 79 all the way up to about right here, which is 1998, which was a, the last big El Nino warming. We're probably going to have one this year as well. But this was the last big El Nino warming, so there's the trend. And since that time, you can see the data shows that we're actually flattening or decreasing. And in fact, statistically, from here back 18 years, six months, the climate of the, of the, temperature, the temperature of the Earth has not been warming. If anything, it has been cooling. So that's interesting. Global warming, climate change. This is well recognized. People know it's happening. You don't hear about it too much. Okay, so what have we concluded? Well, we're going to actually have a little bit more temperature data here. Uh, this is the temperature data from the IPCC. So that's the In Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This is the UN sanctioned um, body. So one thing that a lot of people don't know is their mandate, their mandate is to evaluate information, scientific, scientific information, on man-made climate change and its impacts. Okay, so just think of what I just said. Okay, so I said impact of information on man-made climate change. So that tells me that they've actually made a conclusion. The conclusion is that it is man-made climate change. 
So if you remember back to that cartoon that I started off with, when you have your conclusions and you try and find your facts, you come up with a faulty report. Okay, so that's just, I won't say anything more than that. So what, did, what in 1990, what did the IPCC report here? This is their temperature graph. It starts off around 900 AD. Hey, it looks kind of like what we were just showing. Medieval warm period, little ice age, present day. Right? That seems reasonable, seems to match all the data. In 2001, though, they had quite a different report of temperature. And these are the same scale. So you can see that it's, it's quite a different report. This is called the, the famous hockey stick chart. So well, let me explain it. So this blue here, which goes up like this, like a hockey stick, is data from tree rings, corals, ice cores, etc., etc. And this, the fellow who made this is uh, Michael Mann, who is a professor at um, Penn State University. He then input this information that he gathered and put it into a statistical program, an algorithm in a statistical program, and came up with this. So he actually shows the Earth cooling over that period of time, and then right at 1900, boom, up it goes. And you can see in red, that actually is the true data from temperature information, thermometers. So that's the real stuff. So he says, okay, look, I'm, I'm matching it right here. I don't have temperature data here uh, that's direct, but I do have it right there. So sort of said, okay, that's an unusual thing to see. It's kind of straight and then going up like that. How often does that happen in, in Mother Nature? Well, we can show it, it does happen relatively often once you have the right time scale. But this would be occurring within uh, ten, a few tens of years. So actually some scientists from University of Guelph looked at this information and concluded that the statistical uh, program or algorithm that he used would have shown this shape if you'd put soup in or nuts in or any information. The information that was put in was being warped by the algorithm that was shaping it. So this is not true. This is not believed by people who have looked through it. Um, it's called the hockey stick chart, and you can see it actually does not show the medieval war period, which has been shown by over 2,000 uh, papers in the literature, and it does not show the Little Ice Age, but yet 11 years before their reports were showing exactly those things. So, but this uh, IPCC report and the hockey stick chart are being used still by Al Gore and are being quoted by the IPCC. Okay. Uh, last little bit of uh, temperature information right here. Starting in 1979 up to right here is about 2012. Temperature data here in Celsius. So the blue and the green is actual temperature data from the balloon sets and the satellite. You can see since 79 it's gone up about 0.25 of a degree. What's that red line? Well that's the average of 102 model runs, global warming model runs that have been done by by uh, climate change scientists. And you can see mo most of them were done in the sort of mid-90s or in this realm right in here. So you can see at the beginning, the models actually match uh, the actual reality. Or well, you can say, well, that's, that's really good. Well, it's, it's because they were modeling backwards. They were here, they knew what it ha had happened, so they were able to model it. But then from that point onwards, this is what was predicted. This is the model, this is 102 model runs. So there's a lot of data here. You can see that it basically is not matching what you can see from the actual data sets. And in fact, if you look at 2015, where we are right here, which would be about 0.25, and you go up here, this is reading 0.85. That's 0.6 of a degree difference than what is actually being um, recorded from our, our measurements. However, the IPCC continues to, to defend these models as these are models done by scientists based off of information, um, and they're predicting that the uh, Earth is going to warm up in this fashion. But the actual data is not showing us that. Okay? So, so that's it for, for temperature. Let's go on to, because we've done that sort of that information there. So the temperature is rising post-industrial times, but it's cooled over the last 15 years. 
How about carbon dioxide? Now we're going to have a look at the evolution of carbon dioxide. So here we're going to go back again 500 and something million years right here. And on this side here is the um, how many times more than it is basically right now. So this is one times, this would be 20 times right here. And you can see back about 450 million years ago, if you look at this blue, the average right here, this blue line right here, CO2 was about 20 times what it is right now. Just remember that number. I'm going to get back to that in a little while. And you can see it takes this big drop here. What's happening? Well, actually, in the Ordovician Silurian around 450 million years ago, organisms in the sea were starting to understand how you could take calcium and CO2, combine them to create skeletons. So you started to get the first coral reefs, the stromatoporoids, the brachiopods, the trilobites that we now see in the fossil record. They were starting to evolve at that time. Of course, they're taking CO2 out of the oceans. What else is happening around this time? So in the Devonian time, about 400 million years ago, land plants are starting to diversify. What do plants do? They take, they do photosynthesis, they pull the CO2 out of the atmosphere. So the two of them combined, look what happens to the CO2. It just rockets down like this. Then there's sort of like a little bit of a hiatus where it kind of goes up and down until the final last drop, which is the angiosperms or the flowering plants that came up about 100 million years ago. Down they go. They are taking more of the CO2 out until you actually arrive at where we are right now, which is actually the lowest CO2 in the history of the Earth right now. Let's move to a little bit more recent information. And now this is from that Vostok ice core, which we saw this information be coming right from those little bubbles that we talked about here. So zero here, 400,000 years, and on this side is the CO2 in parts per million. So you can see, about 415,000 years ago, 280 ppm. Boom, down it goes to about 190. Up, down, up, down, up, down, to about where we are right now, which is about 280. This was about 1950 or so, 1950, 1960. Now, I've highlighted the lowest point that you can see here, which is 185 ppm. Just put that back into your memory banks, because we're going to go to that one as well. You can see <coughs> highs and lows all the way along here, completely irrespective of man. This is happening naturally, right? Nothing's, nothing's going on when there's no funny business going on here. Now, since 1960, a fellow called Dr. Keeling has been at his Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii, has been taking very, very, I don't know how often, but it's, all, it's every day anyway. He takes a lot of information, and since the late 50s, he's been documenting this, and this is called the Keeling Curve. And you can see, it's a relatively steady increase to where we are right now at about 400 parts per million. And this is right up to date, November 2015. So we're at 400 parts per million. So let's have a look at this information, and we're going to add it on to this Vostok core. So you can see now 260, 280, 280, 260, 280, 280. This is where we are. Basically, it's, if you change that, it would be, it'd be 400. It'd be in about the same spot. So it should be right there, right now. So you can see there has been a marked increase in CO2 that you would, from what you'd expect in a natural scenario, which is around 280. So it is higher, it is increasing above what you would expect. And what's causing that? I don't 100% know, but I would say because of the timing of it, that, is, that CO2 is coming from man-made emissions. Okay, I'll just leave you with that one. Okay, now the big thing is, is that causing the change. So is the CO2 a real bomb? Is it, is it the thing that's causing temperatures to go up? Or what, what, what's the interplay between those two variables? We've seen both of them separately. Now we're going to put them together. But before we do that, we're going to try and understand how CO2 would affect our temperature. So first of all, Mr. Sun is over here, warms up our Earth. Some of it actually so warms up the Earth. Some of it um, uh, bounces off, is reflected. Some of it comes off and is reflected within the atmosphere, back and forth. And you can see here, this is called the greenhouse effect. CO2 and other gases in the atmosphere trap the heat, keeping the Earth warm. This is great. This is why we're here. What would the temperature of the Earth be if we did not have the atmosphere? 
I'll just let you think about that. Minus 18 degrees Celsius is what the temperature would be. And because we have a current uh, average global temperature of plus 15, that change is 33 degrees. That's all being caused by this right here. So thank goodness for this greenhouse effect because the entire world would be an ice house, 10 degrees colder than the coldest temperature in the last glacial period. No life. Okay, so thank heavens for this. Okay, so that's good. CO2 and other gases. So what are the gases in the atmosphere? Okay, well, let's have a look. Okay, so there's a big red <laughs> thing right here. What's that? Nitrogen. Hmm, it's a little bit more than I would have expected, but that's exactly what it is, 76.55%. What's the other big one? Oxygen. Good, we need oxygen. What else we got? Argon. Uh, Water vapor, about 2%. That does vary depending on where you are on, on the Earth's uh, um, surface, but that's the average is 2%. Okay, like, a, wow, look at the carbon dioxide, 0 0.03. Actually, right now, because it's gone up, because of uh, that extra that I showed, it's 0.04%. 0.04%. Of the atmospheric gas composition of the Earth is carbon dioxide. Wow, okay. So, Let's talk about greenhouse gases. Okay, so greenhouse gases on here, I took the information from here from what the greenhouse gases are, and I made the next slide. Okay, there's a big blue thing. What is that? It's water vapor. Water vapor is a greenhouse gas. And in fact, it's at least 95% of the greenhouse gas effect is caused by water vapor. CO2 is about 4% at best. So when people start talking about greenhouse gases, we say, thank goodness for greenhouse gases. Absolutely. It's water vapor. It's clouds. That's a greenhouse gas. That's by far the biggest greenhouse effect. When you think of a desert where there's no clouds, okay, warms up to 50 degrees during the day. And at night, it cools down unbelievably. Like minus five is very, so like 50, 55 degrees change in a desert. Why? There's no clouds. There's nothing to hold the heat in. It warms up, but off it goes. If you think here in Calgary uh, during the summer, if we heat up the land here, during, we have a nice su summery day. If the clouds roll in overnight, it doesn't cool down. But if you have a clear night, it cools down. Why is that? Water vapor, it's clouds. CO2 is not causing any of that. If we didn't have any clouds. The CO2 is not gonna hold it in, not gonna keep us warm. This is a big thing. However, when you talk to the Environmental Protection Agency or the IPCC, they give you graphs like this, which this is the correct title, U.S. Greenhouse Gas Emissions in 2011, and they all kind of look like this, which shows carbon dioxide at 84% of the greenhouse gases. But they don't say it's gas, greenhouse gas emissions, they say greenhouse gases. So we all go away and say, hey, the dominant greenhouse gas is CO2. Well, it's not, it's water vapor, but the, the dominant emissions or carbon dioxide. Big difference. And methane is about 10%. Okay, now, so we've just seen a little bit about CO2. We've seen the temperature. Now we're gonna roll them all together. So this is, again, going back our five, 600 million years ago. In blue is our temperature. You can see it up and down like we talked about it. And in red is the atmospheric CO2. So you can see early on, it's very high. This is kind of high, but we know this drops off right here. It's not really dropping off here. Here the CO2 is dropping a bit, or quite a bit, and we know why that is. That was because of the, uh, the calcium carbonate and the land plants happening. That's what caused that to drop off. You can see, okay, well, there's a bit of a drop right here. There's also a big glaciation event going on right here. And then there's a bit of a rise, whereas this comes up, bit of a drop, this is not really dropping. I wouldn't say there's a one-for-one -one relationship between the two, uh, particularly in this area here, real high, this is dropping off right here. So not a 100% relationship, but it's data going way back. Let's see if we can look at, ah, the Vostok ice core. This is good data, right? So let's have a look, and boy, Jesus, look at these. The red is CO2, the blue is temperature. Boy, they, up, they're tracking each other, up and down. This is tremendous, in fact, Mr. Gore uses this in one of his uh, displays as being definitive proof that um, CO2 controls temperature. Okay, fair enough. Let's have a look at that. 
Okay, if that was the case, if CO2 controlled temperature, then CO2 would go up or go down, then temperature would follow it. Well, in actual fact, you look at this graph, the temperature goes down, then the CO2 goes down. You can see it's always the same. There's another big one here. Temperature goes down, CO2 goes down. The temperature goes up, you can see right here. There's a lag of about 800 years is what the typical lag on this entire graph is. Temperature is controlling CO2, not the other way around. Why is that happening? Well, the oceans are a huge sink of CO2, by far the biggest sink of CO2. When the temperature of the, la of the air drops, so is the temperature of the oceans. So it keeps the CO2 in the ocean dissolved. As soon as the temperature goes up, what do you get with water? Well, it evaporates. CO2 goes into the, into the air. It's very simple relationship. CO2 is not controlling temperature. It's the other way around. So if you use that and you believe that, that's the central tenet for climate change right there. Now, if you believe what I just said, you'd have to say there is no backing to the climate change argument at all. So but let's just leave it there at the moment. Let's continue. So now we're going to zoom into in the industrialized era right here. Remember I talked about this. This is the, the increase in temperature in blue. There's another increase right here. This is the CO2. Oh, look, at it. it's going up absolutely in parallel with this temperature. In fact, a lot of the graphs that you see from the IPCC and uh, global change advocates stop them at 1960. So this is what you see. So the relationship between CO2 and temperature is, looks pretty good right there. But when you add, add, as you should do as a proper scientist, as much information as you can, then you have to say that the temperature rose at exactly the same rate here as here, but the CO2 was barely going up. And in fact, in this area here, where the temperature is going down, the CO2 is going up in a very short period of time. There is no relationship. If you want to find one, there is. But you have to just look at this little piece right here. If you take the blindfold off and you look at the rest of it, and we took, we went way back, we went 500 million years. Definitively, there is no relationship between CO2 and temperature. Uh, there's no uh, causative relationship between CO2 and temperature at all. Final graph right here for this. You've seen this. This is the temperature from 1980. Remember we said it was going up to this El Nino year, and then it's flattened there. And in fact, we're sitting right here right now. But look what happened to CO2 since that, since the same time. It's very, very regular, continuing its way up here. So you can see, if you want to say that CO2 is affecting temperature, then right at this point where it starts to cool, this this temperature should have continued up like this. We should be up here right now, but we're not. So there isn't a one-for-one -one relationship. Again, um, that's what the information is. This is the facts, okay? You can draw your own conclusions. That's the facts. Okay, so it's not CO2, and I'm kind of suggesting that it's not CO2 changing these temperatures. We've seen temperature changes. Look at the Arctic islands. I showed you that. I showed you a kilometer of ice in Calgary. What, what's changing these? Why are these things changing? Well, there are actually a number of natural things that we can go and look at. Extraterrestrial factors or land, ocean, and atmosphere factors. We're going to look at a couple here to start with the Earth-Sun geometry and the solar output. These are big things because the sun is a big thing. Let's start with this. So a fellow, um, a Serbian, uh, Mr. Milankovic, 1912, came up with the Milankovic cycles. He, is, he was an astronomer, a mathematician, and a geophysicist. So geophysicist, I wanted to add that in for you. So he came up with three different, these are all theoretical back then because he had, didn't have the information that we have now, but they were theoretical from the Earth and the Sun's geometry and how he saw them moving. And it has been it has held up into the future here as well. So every hundred thousand years, he's called it eccentricity right here. The uh, path of the Earth around the Sun will change from an oval to a more of a circular path. So you can just imagine what effect that might have on temperatures on the Earth. 
So that's every 100,000 years. That's a big thing. The other one he pointed out was every 40 or so thousand years, the axis that the Earth is tilted on changes by two or three degrees. You know, that doesn't sound like very much, but if you tilt closer to the sun, a couple of degrees, that's going to make a difference every 40,000 years. And there's another one that I called the wobble. This is a precession about every 25,000 years. Okay? So just remember, remember that one particularly. Do we have any information for that? Well, look at this. So this is the long-term, or I'm calling them Milankovitch cycles, from the Vostok core. So we go back to the Vostok core. This is the temperature. So temperature on the side. This is zero. So this is today right here. That's so all it's done is just colored it up from what we saw before. So you can see here's the interglacial cycles right here in purple. And in blue are the glacial cycles in between. Now, you can see they do seem relatively regular. Well, actually, if you look at it, they're almost exactly 100,000 years apart. What was that? Hey, that was that eccentricity Milankovitch cycle. It's almost bang on. This one here is a little shorter. So is there a little mucking about here to do with uh, a tilt and uh, the precession? I'm not sure. But you can see there are other little things that are going on as well that have a shorter term cycle as well. So definitely this is something that is going on here. And I think this explains the regularity <coughs> and the cyclicity to what we're seeing. In fact, if you look at where we are today, you see we're about, about the eight or nine thousandths year in an interglacial. That's about as long as these other ones lasted. And look what happened. Within a thousand or so years, the temperature actually dropped by four or five degrees. Oh, it's kind of ominous where we're sitting right now. What else do we have to support this sun kind of concept? Well, again, we have information documented from the literature all the way back to the 1600s. They were documenting sunspots. How many you saw per month? So back here is earlier information. And then from then on, these actually sunspots were actually labeled a number. This is number one. This is number 25. So you can see, early on, they recognized that when you have very few sunspots, there's, it has an effect on the temperature. The Little Ice Age was in a zone where there was almost no sunspots. Then we came out of the Little Ice Age, and then the Dalton minimum occurred during the Dickens winters. So now we're down again, and now you can see coming up and down. And you know as we come into 1945, that was a peak of the temperature. So there it is, the modern maximum. Hey, it actually correlates exactly right with sunspots. Then we see a little drop, which is exactly what happened after the war, Second World War. And then a little rise, as you can see us going into modern day. In the last two sunspot cycles, there's the peak, one, two. And this is data to May 2015. It's going down. Temperature, if it's being controlled by suns, the sun, is actually telling us that it would be going down, much like you saw here and here. Final thing to do here with, with the sun. So you can see here, this is the uh, global uh, air temperature. It says Arctic. It's the same thing as the global. You can see it comes up, down, and up between 1880 and 2000. They've charted the solar irradiation at the same time on the same scale. And there, it has a beautiful correspondence. Now, we also see at the very bottom here, as well as when world hydrocarbon use started to peak or started to get going, around 1950, again, right after the Second World War, you can see exponential growth in the metric tons of carbon used. And that's in billions of tons. And you can see there, this is a very straight line right here. You can say, well, it seems to correlate with this here. But what about that package right there? It's hardly, nothing is happening for world hydrocarbon use. What about that drop? Well, actually, the world hydrocarbon use was going up in that period. There's no correlation, as it says right here, between hydrocarbon use and temperature. OK. But I thought we said, oh my gosh, CO2 is a terrible thing. That's what I'm hearing. And it's going up over 100 ppm over the last 50 or 60 years. Oh gosh, it's going to kill us all. OK, it's a colorless, odorless, tasteless gas. How much do you think it would take to make you feel drowsy? Well, I looked this up. 
What, what's it going to take to kill you? What's it going to take you to feel drowsy? 25 times what it is right now, you would feel drowsy. Remember, I asked you to remember um, a uh, figure of the times on that phanerozoic carbon dioxide thing. The world has never had, from this analysis, a higher um, uh, CO2 than 20 times present. So I'm telling you, 20 times you'll feel drowsy. That's it. The world has never been in a position where you would be killed by breathing CO2. Okay, so is it a pollutant, as the uh, Environmental Protection Agency is telling us now, or is it critical for life? Well, we all know there's CO2 is everywhere in the atmosphere. I told you, a huge store in the ocean. Of course, the biosphere, humans, animals, trees. And there's also a massive carbon store, which is basically sitting there, and it can't be basically recycled very easily in the lithosphere. This is the deposits of limestone that I was talking about when organisms figured out how to do a calcium carbonate skeleton. They took the CO2 out of the oceans never to return. They're in rock. It's never going to go back unless someone, like if it comes to the mountains, it might be dissolved a little bit, but it's stuck in the lithosphere. Coal, oil, and gas, same. It's sequestered down there unless we find it and get it out. And then at that time, you take it into power plants, and then it goes to fossil fuel emissions. So this is, the, this is where all the carbon is. It's everywhere, carbon dioxide. This is what we call the equation of life photosynthesis. We talked about this early on, how it dramatically changed the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere way back in the Devonian time, 400 million years ago. Carbon dioxide, water, in the presence of light and chlorophyll, hey, that's food, that's glucose. And hey, we need that too, oxygen. This is very important, we need this. If we didn't have this, we didn't have plants doing this, there would be no vegetarians, animals, no, no one, and then we wouldn't be able to eat them, right? There would be no us and no them, no nothing. Okay, so this is interesting. Okay, so we talked about greenhouse gases, right? So I thought, well, what's that got to do with greenhouses? Well, so I pulled it up. Oh, what the hell? So here's a picture of a greenhouse. So I thought, well, what, what's, what's a dangerously high, what's a dangerously low CO2, and like, what's normally in a greenhouse? Well, here's the first piece of information from this source right here. Plants cannot survive at CO2 levels below 150 parts per million. Geez, now remember I asked you to remember that one, what the CO2 was back at the last glacial, glaciation low? It was 185. We were 30 ppm away from basically killing all our plant life. It was suffering at that time. Of course, the whole world was covered by, a lot of it was covered by ice, but it also had this incredibly low CO2. Plants like CO2. Why? How much do they like? Well, let's have a look at this. This is something. This blew my mind. Most greenhouses have one of these things in it. Well, what is it? It's a CO2 generator. It produces optimum growing conditions of about 1,500 ppm. The optimum growing is up to 1,500 to about 2,000. That's four or five times what we're breathing right now. They're pumping it into greenhouses to grow our food. Oh my gosh. It's toxic. It's got to be. No, it grows really, it, I'm coming to it, it grows faster, healthier, sturdier than if we didn't put this. So let's have a look at the data surrounding that. Here's a fabulous experiment from Inzo and Kimball in 1997. They took the same um, uh, pine trees and grew them in different CO2 conditions. This is just outside, ambient, okay, 385 at that time, 1997. Then they put them in environments where they increased the CO2 to 150, 300, and 450. So you can see this 450, so in other words, a total of 835 ppm versus the ambient, so it's about double. It actually, it's almost double the size. Same time, same water, same light, same everything. Double the size. That looks pretty healthy to me. This is hard to see a little bit, but I wanted to put this in. The growth response to 300 ppm additional CO2. This is amazing. So for grains, vegetables, fruits, and trees, if you increase the environment by 300 ppm from what it is, just what we breathe, 
You increase grains by 36%, vegetables by 46%, fruits by 33%, and trees by 71%. This is not just a couple of, of uh, studies. Look at the number of studies down in here that have documented this. This is a real thing. CO2 is good. Animals like it. Plants like it. How about this? This is really interesting as well. So this is done by the uh, CSIRO, which is the Australian Scientific Organization. So they, d they documented, using satellite data, the percent increase in foliage, so tree cover, over the world from about a 30-year period, 1982 to 2010. You can see everything that's green or this gray, blacky, or purpley kind of color has, is better than it was in 1982. In other words, it's increased. Look at Australia, India, Europe, Africa, South America, and most of North America. It's greened, and they're, they're, they did this study. I'm just quoting their study. They called it desert greening from rising CO2. They did not relate it to increasing rainfall or anything. They did not find that. They found, they said that. And here's an example. This is from the Australian shrubland, 2011. This is what it used to look like, that sort of deserty, nasty area. And now what it looks like, it's greening. No change in rainfall. This is just the ambient CO2 going up by about 100 ppm. CO2 is critical for life on Earth. We have to love CO2, not try and take it out of the atmosphere and put it away. We need to have a certain minimum amount of CO2 for our plants to live and for us to live. Okay, so we've done, we've done temperature, we've done CO2, we've done the relationship of them. We talked a little bit about CO2. Now I want to get in the final part of the talk here is about um, climate change and its effect on rising sea level, or is it? Glaciation, are they, uh, are they receding, are they growing, I ice caps? We're gonna do all that right now so that you have the information to chat with your friends at cocktail parties at Christmas. This is very interesting stuff, it's very interesting. Okay, what I call, so The Inconvenient Truth is the book and the movie that Al Gore put together in uh, 2006 won an Academy Award in 2007, according to this sheet here. It's by far the most terrifying film you will ever see. Uh, okay, just, I'll just take that one in. So I added this little thing here. I've got some inconvenient facts about the inconvenient truth. Okay, so let's have a look. Okay, these are things that come right out of this inconvenient fact. The polar ice caps are melting at a rapid rate. And here's the Hubbard Glacier in Alaska. Pieces breaking off. Okay, is that what's happening? Okay. Okay, so this is the Antarctic sea ice extent from NOAA data. That's pristine, beautiful data right up to July of 2015. So what it shows you is along the bottom here, this is the 1st of January. This is the end of every year. And it documents the sea ice in millions of square kilometers on this side. And what I want draw your eye, eye in is this black curve, which is the average of 1981 to 2010. 30 years of average sea ice. So there it is, right there. You can see in the winter time, this is the winter time in Antarctica. It's big and lots of ice, and it drops off and melts into their summer. This is their summer. Where's 2015? Well, I've shown it. Red is right here. It's above the average. In fact, if this continues in this direction right here, about the same amount, we're going to have over 20 million square kilometers of sea ice in Antarctica. It's growing. The Arctic. Similar story, a little different. This is the gray, and this gray line right here is the mean value for about 20 years, 1979 to 2000. 2015 is shown in black. And you can see it's on the lower end of the average, no question, it's on the lower end of the average. It's still within the average of that period right there. And you can see the other uh, 2011 to 2014 are all sitting in that same area right there. But the maximum this year was about 15 million square kilometers of ice. Okay, this, this is interesting. This is Mr. Gore. 
talking in 2008, the entire North Polaroid ice cap will disappear in five years. I just showed you, it's 15, 000, 15 million square kilometers of ice. That's the picture of it in 2013. It's totally wrong. Glaciers are disappearing at an alarming rate. Oh no. 1700 to 2000. Okay, so we not got this. There's, there's a time scale along here. And this is um, basically zero melting, zero uh, freezing. This way is, if the line goes this way, it's growing. If you go this way, it's melting. And this is from a great study by this Erlmans, 2005. He took data from 169 glaciers around the world with information going way back here into the 1700s. A lot of information from Europe um, has to, to pump into this. So what he's got, you can see from 1700, actually the glaciers were growing, these glaciers that he was looking at, until about 1825, and then, whoops, oops, they start to, they start to uh, uh, disappear. They're starting to melt, and you can see, oh, but there's a very similar trend through all this line, glacial shortening, there's a 180 year trend that's basically a straight line. Okay, so, yeah, they are melting. Maybe a little bit at the top here. They seem to be actually uh, growing a little bit. The important thing is the bottom stuff here, which is we've seen before. Since about 1945 or 1950, the amount of metric tons of carbon burned and gone into the atmosphere has increased exponentially. If that was causing temperatures to go up, that would then cause glaciers to grow or to uh, recede and melt faster. So you would actually see a big trend like this at that point of increasing glaciation shortening. We do not see that. It's flat all the way through for 180 years. Okay, here's another one I like. Rapid sea level rise will cause catastrophic flooding of coastal cities. Create millions of climate change refugees is the latest thing I've heard. New York City with 25 feet sea level rise. That would be catastrophic. That's what it would look like. No more trips for you there, Dale. <laughs> Unless you had a boat. <laughs> so what do we got? What's the data? OK, so sea level. It has been rising for a long time. So along the bottom here, this is today. This is 21,000 years ago, the last glacial maximum right here. And on this side right here is sea level change. You can see during the, the main glacial maximum, sea level was 120 meters below what it is right now. 120 meters. And with the increase in temperature after glacier, uh, the, the glacial, glacial episode coming into the interglacial, you can see sea level starts to rise. And it's well documented. This is all around the world. Lots of data points. It's starting to rise. And in fact, this is a computation I made here. Sea level rise of 1.4 meters, 55 inches in 100 years. So, okay, that's maybe hard to imagine, but that's five and a half inches. That's 10 years. 10 years it would go up that much. That's a lot. And about Eight or nine thousand years ago, as as the temperatures started to level off, and we were melting a lot of the glaciers, you can see the rate of increase slows down a lot to about three millimeters a year, so about thirty millimeters in ten years. We'll get into that in a few moments. So this is the same kind of chart we've been seeing along here so far. So this is eighteen hundred to modern day sea level right here. So you can see actually from 1800, the sea level was going down. This is the, during the Little Ice Age. It was actually going down here. And from about 1850 onwards, hey, yeah, it has been going up. This is the trend, seven inches per century, uh, over a 150 year trend. You can see there's a straight line you can take through. I mean, if you want to, you can draw some steeper things right here. But there's little steepening things and that are linked by flattening areas right there from 1850 onwards. Again, if this was being caused by the amount of carbon that we were using in the atmosphere, that would be increasing the temperature, which would be melting the ice. The sea level history would have suddenly gone like that. 
and it has not, it has not changed. This to me is very definitive information. There's no changes going on. This is all natural stuff. One of my favorites here. This is a sea level history in New York City, 1855 to 2015, a place called the Battery in New York. So they've had, they've had a, uh, a monitor there for this long, 160 years. You can see here, there's no question, it is going up. And it's been going up at a steady rate over the last 160 years of 11 inches, or just about a foot, for per 100 years. So that is about an inch every 10 years. It's going up, there's no question. But it's been going up since recorded time. It's probably continued all the way back down there. Now again, this is when, this is when fossil fuels started to really come into the atmosphere. Again, if, it was, if there was a cause and effect here going on, we would have seen this increase. Definitively, we do not see it. And it is NOAA data, National Oceanographic Atmospheric Administration, right up to date. It's not changing. The frequency intensity of storms is increasing. Oh no. Okay, I got one graph on this right here. So on the bottom here is a number of violent hurricanes shown in blue. The average is around two and a half or three since about 1945. You can see, hey, yeah, there's, there's a few more right now since about 1995. Then there was a hiatus where there was a lot less between there and about 1970, and then a lot more back in here. And apparently there was a lot of them back prior to 1945 as well. This fellow here who um, I went into this paper to look and check the information, he actually said that pre-1966 there was no continual satellite coverage. He said there would be more here than even he has on here. So when you talk to the climate change advocates, what they do is they say, hmm, the number of, in of hurricanes is increasing. Well, it is from here. But if you compare it to here, it's high, low, high. It's just part of the overall cycle. But it is increasing. But in a, when you get all the data, you show it's not. It's just natural. OK, so now we're going to wrap up here. So basically, climate change advocates, we looked at increasing global temperature from pre-industrial times. Well, basically, the temperature's gone like this, up and down for hundreds of millions of years. There's nothing unusual happening right now for rising temperatures. Rising concentration of greenhouse gases, well, we agreed. Yeah, the CO2 has gone up about 100 ppm over the last 50 or so years. I'm not gonna debate that, it, it has. Is it man-made emissions of carbon dioxide that are causing any temperature to increase? Remember, the temperature hasn't increased for 18, the last 18 years. We showed that there wasn't a relationship. And if there was, temperature was controlling CO2, not the other way around. Remember, that's the central tenet of the climate change advocates. And finally, severe and catastrophic changes. Are they occurring? No. They're just natural long-term cycles. Let's have a look. Climate change skeptics, or as we're you know, nicely called, deniers. There is no convincing scientific evidence. Well, I think we probably agree with that. And as well, increases in atmospheric carbon dioxide produce many beneficial effects. Well, you know, I think we'd have to agree with this one, or at least I would. And as of 2007, the Oregon petition was also signed by 31,000 American scientists, including 9,000 PhDs. This is exact wording of that Oregon petition. Didn't tell you early on. Now I'm telling you. That's what these people agreed to. So if someone says, hey, I think it's all bogus and the scientists are all agreeing, well, 9,000 PhDs, if I'd sign it, would be 9,030, um, do not agree with this. This is my favorite global warming thing. Global warming does everything according to, to climate change people. Even kills this guy here. <laughs> Why? Why is this? Why is this enigma out there? What's going on? How did this all happen? Why do all the politicians, everyone say, we're gonna die, it's, it, global warming is gonna kill us all? Why? It all started here, it really did. 
started with Mr. Gore, bless his heart, 1962, Harvard, he was in a Harvard class by a Dr. Ravel, gave a, uh, an introductory lecture on uh, CO2 <coughs> and the potential effects, potential effects it could have on uh, temperature increases. It was just a rough idea. Mr. Gore took it as his cause. It's happening. Mr. Gore is and was an English major at Harvard who then went into governmental studies. He's not a scientist. But he took this cause, and at that time, you know, good for him. He's an environmentalist. This is, this is all good. Then what happened? Then he becomes a US senator between these times right here. Funding for global warming projects rocketed. Why? Because of him. So you get funding going into the scientific realm, scientists grappling for a lot of money. The only way you're going to get it is if you agreed that climate change, global warming was happening. That's how you got the money. So you get a bunch of people coming in, I, I gotta have some more of this money, I need to have some information so I can make my thesis. That's when it all started, right there. Then he moves in, 93, right in to be uh, Clinton's US VP. He's a strong supporter of the Kyoto Protocol, 1997. Then, obviously, after that time, then Bush and his administration came in. So during that time, uh, Mr. Gore decided that he was going to write his book, his definitive book, Inconvenient Truth, and make the movie which won the Academy Award in 2007. And also, this information here also won him, along with the IPCC, the Nobel, Nobel Peace Prize in 2007. This information did. So you can see what's happening. Noble cause, political unbelievable, funding money, Hollywood media. All of it is all wrapped up right here. So you say, what's happened? If the whole issue has become politicized. Right? It's the science is gone. I showed you some of the science here. It's gone, in my humble opinion. <laughs> politics. OK, so again, we're getting close to the end here. So politics. <coughs> This is a, a New York Times poll. Do you think climate change is a serious problem? Look at the voting. The, the people who voted yes, 71% of them were Democrats. The people who voted no were Republican. 83% of them were Republican. If you, if you came into Canada, just that blue would be liberal. That red would be conservative, I'm suggesting. So it's definitely, there's a big party split. You wonder why nothing happened when Bush came in after, after the administration of the Hillary of the Clinton? It's because he's Republican. Notable recent quotes, I would still call them alarmist. Climate change is the greatest threat to humanity. Barack Obama, he said this 23 times this back, apparently. Climate change is the worst threat we are facing this century. Well, this is our own foreign minister, Stefan Dion, 2015 right after the Paris attacks. The Paris Conference of Parties. The conference is the last effective opportunity to protect the poor and vulnerable from climate change that gravely endangers their lives. This is what is being said out there. No wonder normal people out there go, oh my gosh, this is absolutely crazy. We're, gonna, we're all gonna die and it's climate change is gonna kill us. This is what drove me. When I was reading these things, I was like, this can't be right. Money. Well, that's always a big thing, right? Some recent government spending examples. 2014, greenhouse gas research, $5 billion into the science and university environment. Renewables, subsidies, the total was $16 billion. That's a lot of money. <coughs> 2016 to 2021, our federal government's getting involved now. Mr. Trudeau committed $2.65 billion in Malta about a week ago to fund third world for lower carbon emissions. We're paying for that. You're paying for that. And just to bring it even closer to home, in 2015, our Alberta government spent $745 million as part of a larger $1.35 million Shell Quest carbon capture and storage system. So it's taking out of the oil sands it takes the CO2 out, it liquefies it, it puts it along a 50 kilometer long pipeline, 
and sequestered us in a <coughs> reservoir under the ground. Now, I just mentioned to you, and I, I believe, CO2 is not a bad thing. That's just pure CO2. They took it out of, out of the air, put it in, and now it's under the ground. And look how much, and I, I, we don't need to do that. That cost $745 million, the Alberta government. $120 million for, from the federal government was added into that total. That's the cost of the new um, cancer center in Calgary. It went into what I would say is a completely <coughs> wasted project. Completely wasted. The media. Oh, there we go. Global climate crusade. <coughs> History's gener judgment of generation. We can save our planet. They like. They sell their papers. They have viewers on TV. This is how they do it. But this is all stirred up, right? And finally, here's our friends, Mr. Celebrities. <laughs> we all know, you know, what they're saying. Again, bless their hearts. They just don't have the facts. They don't have them. This is unbelievable. <laughs> Daryl Hannah, we all think of her as being chained to the White House. Exactly. She actually yeah. was the executive producer of the, 2013, uh, of the 2013 film, Greedy Lying Bastards, which actually is a film that takes a look at deniers of climate change, scientists, politicians. This is what the film was called. Mr. Redford. We can no longer claim ignorance as an excuse for inaction. The jury is no longer out. Climate change is real. You bet you boot it's this. It's been going on for hundreds of millions of years. <laughs> it's not just a threat for the future, but happening here and now. And here we go, religious now. And as Pope Francis so eloquently points out, climate change is a moral imperative that transcends politics. Here's religion in the middle of it now. Now we got everything, politics, money, celebrities, media, religion. Where's the science? What happened? It's gone. Finishing up with little quotes here from actual scientists that are on the climate change advocates panel. The science is settled. The debate's over. 2014. We've all heard that one, right? Well, I think today you might have thought, yeah, maybe, maybe there's a little something that might be not quite right in that. 2012, global warming will cause more hurricanes. Here's Mr. Gore in 2008. The Arctic will be ice-free by 2013. 2007, these are actual quotes. Global warming will cause fewer hurricanes. Now they're saying it caused more hurricanes. Okay. Last two slides. To me, this is my soapbox. Instead of focusing on perceived man-made climate change, which I don't think is happening at all, let's focus on real pollution. A couple of examples here. Sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, and particulates, the little ash coming from coal-fired plants. And we're talking about shutting coal-fired plants down because they're shoving CO2 in the atmosphere. That's not the bad stuff. It's this. This is the bad stuff. SO2, that causes, this is the acid rain that no one ever talks about. Our generation, Dale, mine, the, the, uh, the, that's, we used to talk about acid rain and pollution. No one talks about that anymore. You probably don't even know what it means. Particulates, that comes out, little bits of carbon that come out. Apparently, maybe there was just a little article in the paper today. This is bad stuff. You breathe that, it's going to give you these black lungs. That's the bad stuff. Urban smog, you can see that in Calgary, you see it in Los Angeles, kills three million people a year. Discharge of raw sewage into waterways, well, you can see it all over this picture here. We actually do it in Canada. You know how much raw sewage went into the St. Lawrence River here about a, mo about a month ago? I actually computed it. 32 million barrels in four days of raw sewage. Now, they had to do it because they had to take it around, but it, it went in. Victoria still pumps raw sewage right into the ocean. Victoria. Improper garbage disposal. Lack of recycling. We're guilty of it here. It's around the world. That's something that has to change. This is what I think the problem is. Let's talk continue to talk about pollution, not climate change. And finally, so this is the final slide here. So I think with clean burning fuel, and I think this is great, we're moving towards away from coal and into natural gas with responsible development of renewals. Not right away, let's, let's not jump into it, but let's put some money into solar and wind. This is great, I, I love this. So these two things together are gonna give us our energy 
and then us, we have to work on recycling and energy efficiency, and this will protect our health, environment, and economy for future generations. Thank you.